hello everybody. My name is Sophia Close. I'm the Head of Gender and Peacebuilding at Conciliation Resources. Myself and Johanna Putanan, who is the Head of Women in Peacemaking Program at CMI Mati Atuseri Peace Foundation, and I will act as your moderators today. On behalf of Conciliation Resources and CMI, I'm so pleased to welcome you to our global launch of our report titled Integrating Gender into the DNA of Peacebuilding, Learning from Peers. This webinar will launch our new report and provide clear examples of why, why this approach is critical for effective and strategic policy and programming. Please note that um, there is interpretation in Spanish for this event. So uh, down the bottom of your screen, you will see a button that allows you to choose uh, which language you would prefer to select, uh, English or Spanish. Please note that we will also be recording this event and we will share the link later. The recording will be available on YouTube or Vimeo. This is a webinar platform, so panelists will um, be able to uh, be view only for this and attendees will be muted at all times. You will first hear from speakers, then we will open up for Q&A and have a short wrap up at the end. Um, there's a chat box and throughout the presentations, we encourage you to post comments and questions. Um, and we please, when you do that, can you add your name and your organisation before you post the question? Obviously, due to time constraints, we won't get to all these questions, but please, uh, please uh, add your comments in. At the start, I would like to introduce Yane Talas, who is the CEO of CMI, Mate Artisiri Foundation, who will provide a welcome to this event. Please go ahead, Yane. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, dear colleagues, friends, my connection has been a bit patchy, so I hope this will carry me for the next uh, few minutes. Uh, hey, on behalf of CMI, Marti Artisar Peace Foundation, Conciliation Resources, and partners, it is a great, my great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, this webinar uh, and our joint uh, report capture a collective learning on a crucial mission integrating a gender perspective in peace building and conflict prevention. For us, for this is CMI, Con Conciliation Resources and Partners, gender integration is not about the separate gender equality agenda. It is simply about doing our peacemaking work better. Yet at its core, doing so requires a fundamental shift and rethink how we function as an organization and how we do our work. This is a major challenge ahead of us and, uh, and one that we need to tackle jointly as a sector. That is why it has been very valuable to come together with a, such a distinguished and active group of peer organizations in the spirit of mutual learning and sharing. Indeed, over the past year, 13 international peace building and conflict prevention organizations have been engaged in dialogue to, to learn from one another. We have spoken frankly of the challenges we face and identified good practices on what actually works on gender integration. Key insights and findings of our dialogue are captured in the publication that we are launching today. It has been truly collective uh, effort. The report is co-authored jointly by all of us. And this is a long list of folks that are behind this report. Conciliation Resources and CMI as the co-conveners with support uh, by and collaboration with Peace Next, together with Berghoff Foundation, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, uh, KIASE, European Institute of Peace, International Alert, International Crisis Group, Masarat, Safer World, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and Sera uh, Serapaz. We feel that this is a beginning of a process. We are therefore delighted to have so many of our esteemed colleagues and friends joining this conversation today. Our mission is clear. We want to integrate gender in the very DNA of conflict resolution and peace building. We invite all of you to join uh, us in this work. All of you. I look forward to an enriching discussion, one that should not stop after this event, but rather take us forward in integrating gender 
into the DNA of peace building and in making us better peace builders. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick, much appreciated. Our next, next speaker is Jonathan Cohen, who is the Executive Director of Conciliation Resources. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us. Two questions for you. To start off, can you let us know why it is important to integrate gender into peace building organisations? Thanks, Sophia, and, and also many thanks to Yanni for those words of introduction. Um, I, I suppose the first thing I'd say is around what is it we exist to do? What, what's our purpose? And, and to me, integrating gender into our work is critical to enable us to achieve our purpose and to achieve our mission as peacebuilding organizations. And I think as peacebuilding uh, organizations and practitioners, we regularly engage with power at multiple levels in, in conflict situations. But what we've realized is that our sector has only relatively recently acknowledged that gendered inclusion is critical to sustain peace. And, and gender is a critical lens through which to, to look at power and marginalization and how these link to a, 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 a fundamental cause of conflict, which is exclusion. So in, in this regard, gender is a, is a means to help us interpret our work, both more broadly, but also more profoundly. And, and in doing so, this gendered lens enables us to engage much more fundamentally with, with our different perspectives on what transformative peace can be. But I think more, more than this, um, what I've seen um, in the work that we do is that by bringing a gendered power analysis, we are much better able to understand the context in which we work. Um, we don't always talk explicitly about gender inequality in what we do, uh, or for instance, with armed groups or with governments with, with whom we engage, but the understanding um, that gender is so central and how we, how we understand power in, 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 in regard to the context where we work, this gives us a different potential to contribute to change in the context where we work and, and with the partners we, we, we engage with. And, and an, an additional dimension of this, I think, has been to think not just about the agency of women in processes of change. And, and, and much of our understanding of gender, I think, originated from thinking about questions around the, the whole women, peace and security agenda. But we, we've learned a great deal about the need to, to think about attitudes to masculinity and how these can shape the sorts of change that is possible. And, and also help us see where the points of resistance are in conflict systems. And so by thinking about gender, by thinking about masculinity, by, by deconstructing these issues, we're, we're better able to examine um, and engage with power in, in processes of conflict transformation. And if I think about the work that we at Conciliation Resources have been involved in, in, in a context such as Northeast Nigeria, where we've worked with young women and men affected by uh, Boko Haram, uh, but also worked intergenerationally in supporting dialogue between women, understanding the, 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 the dynamics around gender and around masculinities absolutely expand the, the potential levers available to us as peace builders. Si sí, podemos expandir los apalacamientos que tenemos como constructores de paz. Si, sí, muchas gracias, Jonathan. Puedes hablar entonces de cuáles son resolution and peace building organizations in terms of integrating gender. Sure. I mean, I think perhaps the, 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 I'll try and give you three or four. And the first one I'd point to is around having clear goals. Um, if I think back at the way we've worked at Conciliation Resources, we, we began to think about gender as a dimension of our peace building work probably more than 15 years ago. And, and we were we were grappling with understanding what it meant for our work. And we've only really included gender integration in our organizational strategy in a, in a clear way since 2015. And what I've seen is that having the strategic focus and actually articulating clear goals within your strategy has been a really important way to help us plan for what we're doing, to, to provide resources, to measure change over time. It's, it's made us much more intentional in, in our approach. And we've, we've seen a steady increase in the way we've, we've been able to draw in senior staff to play responsible roles in, in, in deepening our thinking and engagement around gender. We've made decisions to allocate more unrestricted funding towards gender. We've been able to build a much stronger 
evidence for, for, for how gender inclusion impacts on, on the work that we do. And, and I think it's seen us develop new internal systems and processes to better coordinate the work that we do and, and to measure impact. And through all of this, it's enabled us to, to shift the engagement with our programs teams and get them thinking about how to integrate gender in, into what it is we're doing in all of the contexts we work. Second really important issue is around time. We've learned through this process that integrating gender it is, a, is a gradual process, it's an iterative process, and it does demand time. Um, it's not something you can do overnight and in a hurry. Uh, you've really got to commit to it. And our understanding of these issues has evolved as our practice has developed. And this has come about through a very deep process of shared learning with our partners. Uh, and indeed, I think we've seen how some of our partners have been the inspiration for our work and have, have pushed us forward. And, and actually, it's great to have uh, Rosamilia Salamanca as a speaker today, who I think will, uh, who's been a critical partner for our organization in that regard. And, and, and working with partners like CIASE have demonstrated to us that not only that gender matters, but that focusing on gender and inclusion really works in, in changing the way people engage with peace processes. And, and over time, we've seen that understanding gender requires us to open our eyes to our own privileges and vulnerabilities. And, and this isn't easy. And it involves a considerable personal shift, I think, which is deeply emotional. It's also very political and contextual. And, and it, it, it does take time. Third really important point is around resources. Um, and having financial flexibility through unrestricted funds to, to, to drive this work forward. Um, restricted grants just don't give us the leverage to, to make this happen. And evidence, evidence to date, I think, shows us that the sustained and substantial funding that is needed for inclusion work, particularly um, due to the, the time it takes to engage with, with excluded groups, is, is a central dimension. And I'll, I'll make a final point, which I think is about, um, it's about leadership. Um, with many final points. Yeah, the last, be very quick. With many competing priorities for all of our organizations to, to really effectively integrate gender, we, we need to ensure that um, leadership is on board and, and that it's make, that making decisions and, and monitoring what you do. And that's leadership at the board level. It's leadership at the executive level. Um, to encourage change throughout the organization, but it's also very much leadership um, colleagues such as yourself, Sophia and Johanna, and, and all the partners who've been involved in this process who, who push us forward in our thinking. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. That's really helpful. I'm now going to turn to our colleague Katrina Gorle, who's the Executive Director of Peace Nexus Foundation, who's provided a lot of support throughout this process. Katrina, how can peer learning and gender inclusive organisational development help respond to the challenges that Jonathan just laid out for us? So um, firstly, thank you. And thank you, Jonathan, for doing making my job so easy by making it very clear what those challenges are. Firstly, I'll say that what Peace Nexus mostly does is provide organisational development support for peace building organisations. And that is a broad range of organizations, not just peacemaking, but could be on human rights and social justice, lots of issues. And what I would say is firstly, that we have always said we, you need an inclusive approach to organizational development. And so one of the things we notice first is these issues come up if you are really listening to voices within any peace building organization, when you're Firstly, if you look at clear goals, if you include them in a strategy process, which is most of our work, um, there, the issue of clear goals around gender emerges. So I think um, inclusive, if you're doing inclusive OD, these, some of the challenges you face will be um, tackled sort of automatically. Um, having said that, I, I hear your, your comments on time and resources. Um, one of the the reasons we do what we do is we realize most project funding don't allow time for these really inclusive processes on strategy or even program development. Um, so it is up to the leadership and careful management to enable um, sufficient time and space for, for these really genuine open conversations that go beyond 
um, which really go into the details of, as you say, that the, the positioning of the organization, the relationship with power and how to influence different, um, different groups, but also parts of society in different ways. And, and crucially, a big enabler for this is leadership. And so my, my final point on this is that I think um, how OD can respond is very much about modeling. So not only modeling um, where you want to get to, for example, modeling an inclusive, diverse staff base in a context crosses you know, different groups and et cetera, but also modeling how you go about your work, um, how you develop your strategy, how, how you set HR um, policies and practices, and, and how um, open you are to challenging discourse within the organization as well as outside. So I, I do think that that is an important leverage of power that peace building organizations have that is under-recognized um, as well. Wonderful. Thanks, Katrina. That's that's really useful to hear. I'm, I'm now going to introduce Johanna Potanen, um, my co-designer of this process. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, Johanna, about some of the advantages to undertaking a peer learning process like the one that resulted in this report? Yeah, um, thanks, Sophia. And maybe a few words of the process itself uh, would be in place to begin with. So it was over the past year, it was colleagues from these 13 organizations, we convened regularly in virtual workshops, uh, and each of those unpacked one dimension of gender integration at the time, from conflict analysis to leadership governance, programming, uh, monitoring, evaluation and learning. And the discussion was built around concrete case studies, so on initiatives that organizations have undertaken in their, in their institutions, and a lot of room for open interaction and exchange. And of course, we wanted to involve even more partners, but had to keep the numbers limited to kind of develop that shared space of openness and trust to really have a meaningful exchange. Um, but also balancing with sufficient diversity to make sure that we have different in geographical and institutional settings. Um, and practically that also really meant crossing all of the time zones. So I think special appreciation to those who kind of woke up at crack of dawn or late in the evening to join these conversations. But when it comes to the advantages, I'd highlight particularly three aspects of peer learning. One is that peer learning is practical. The lessons learned and the insights, they're very concrete, not something theoretical or abstract, something that each of us can immediately try and apply in our own work and organizations. Um, and the second thing is, is also that the in insights that you gain from peers are very applicable. I mean, there are some particular challenges and opportunities that relate to our own field of peacemaking that brings to gender integration. And analyzing this together with your peers and colleagues who work in that same space, do similar type of work, really makes that learning relatable, something that we feel that is relevant for us. And of course, I mean, the institutional um, realities are slightly different among the 13 organizations. Everything is not directly applicable, but there is a shared reality. And the third is that you are moving forward as a sector. When we are learning as a collective, you're also kind of molding the practice in the field. Um, I mean, certainly not overnight, but little by little. So we find that it's three, these three factors kind of being practical, uh, applicable and moving as a collective made this peer learning so fruitful. And I we really hope that it's also conveyed in the report. Thanks so much, Johanna. Um, we will now go through the findings of the report um, and uh, partners from different organizations will share each of those. Um, and we'll also have a PowerPoint that has um, these findings on one by one. Uh, first up, we have our colleague Sabrina Kwamba, who is the program lead for gender and inclusion at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Over to you, Sabrina, um, to talk about the first finding of our report. Thanks. Thank you, Sophia. So one of the main findings or the first finding from uh, the process that we conducted over the past few months was that gender integration exists along a, sec a spectrum. So when integrating gender into peace building, uh, organizations are situated across a broad spectrum, which ranges from gender discriminatory to gender transformative approaches. 
and an organization should clarify which approach it wants to achieve and note that at any point in time, different parts of an organization and different programs may sit at different parts of the spectrum. This is something that we've also um, found to be very applicable at HD. And one of the things that we have been doing over the past two years or so is that we have been working to provide our staff with the training, the resources and the expertise to develop their gender analysis and assessment capacities, or as we call it, a sharpen their gender lens. So this enables them to assess their operational work and programming, as well as their own teams and management processes along the gender spectrum, so that they can establish a baseline for where they sit along the spectrum, set ambitious targets, and then trace progress so that, and while also identifying and addressing challenges and hurdles along the way. Great, thanks for that example, Sabrina. Um, our second finding will be presented by Ndo Sal, who is the head of gender and peace building at International Alert. Over to you, Ndo. Uh, thank you very much. Um, sorry. Okay, I'm, start, I'm trying to put my video on. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sophia. And this, the, the second finding, which is, uh, you know, and in my view, one of the most important, so is that uh, uh, the importance of balancing the technical with the political uh, when you integrate gender into a peace building organization. Um, and the, the finding that uh, integrating gender into peace building is not only a technical exercise, uh, it is also fundamentally political, as the focus is on shifting power dynamics to ensure that there is a, a greater in inclusion and gender equality, and, and that the both the technical and the political dimension of change are important and are mutually reinforcing. So, uh, and this also actually, uh, I mean, uh, just, uh, um, I mean, confirm also our, our, you know, our principle at uh, actually inter at uh, International Alert. And uh, uh, what we have been doing uh, in 2019, uh, we commissioned the review that uh, examines actually alert uh, conceptual approach to gender and also uh, assess the way that gender is taken into account of and mainstream both within our program, but also at the institutional le level, including looking at the institutional culture and power relation within international alert. And the findings and uh, the, the recommendation of this review were extensively discussed with it within alert. These discussions were not always easy, but there was a strong consensus about how important this gender review has been for creating an, an uh, emphasis on better analysis of, of uh, actually better uh, uh, trying to analyze power re relations within international alert. Specifically, the main challenges within this area we are identified as, for example, the now the North-South global power relations, the colonial uh, question, the uh, yeah, and then the relationship that we have with local partners, and the problems with communication and trust between headquarters and country offices, and this result and actually this uh, discussion actually led us to develop and to adopt a gender action plan. And this gender action plan sets out concrete step to fully mainstream gender at both programmatic, but also at the better, but also at the institutional level, and to better balance the technical and the political dimensions of gender mainstreaming within an uh, organization. And this gender review has also led to the establishment of a steering committee on gender diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion within ALERT, which, was, which works close, uh, very closely with all the teams to ensure that the gender action plan is fully implemented. So right. both, uh, just my last sentence, so both 
the review, uh, you know, and the work of this group is actually, uh, you know, actually uh, enabling alert to move beyond gender as a technical skills, also apply to programming. But it is driving, uh, I mean, organization change and it help, help us to understand, you know, how important it is to include uh, gender equality within the policies, the, pro the procedures and the practices. Thank you. Thank you, Ndai. Um, <laughs> thanks so much. Our next finding will be discussed by Rosa Emilia Salamanca, who's the executive director of Corporation D, I'm going to say this badly, uh, Rosa Emilia, you could perhaps do it better, CSA, the Corporation de Investigation Actions Social Economica. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you. I think you have to switch because I'm going to speak Spanish. <clears throat> bueno, buenos días a todos. Ha sido realmente un privilegio poder participar en esta investigación y yo quisiera concentrarme en, los, eh, en lo que se encontró alrededor del liderazgo y de los compromisos organizativos cuando estamos hablando de estas acciones de cambio. Yo creo que es clave eh, pensar que el género, como lo decía la persona que habló antes de mí, no es solamente un ejercicio técnico, es también un ejercicio político, pero también es un ejercicio de transformación cultural muy profunda. Y las organizaciones tienen que buscar la manera a través de la cual puedan apoyar su staff para lograr los mecanismos suficientes en esa estrategia de deliberación interna y de integración que va cambiando las personas. Esto no es ajeno al género y toda esta discusión cambia los discursos, cambia las percepciones, cambia las miradas y por lo tanto debe transformar los mecanismos internos, inclusive de, de transformación y resolución de conflictos internamente. En algunos casos, en algunas organizaciones que trabajamos fuertemente el tema de género, hemos tenido contradicciones muy fuertes por las nuevas percepciones. Por ejemplo, eh, alguien en una organización denunció que la manera en que se expresaban los hombres en la organización hacia las mujeres en términos comunicativos era muy violenta e impositiva. Para muchos eso fue una discusión muy fuerte en términos de entender si eso era impositivo, si era un privilegio de género, si era una manera que había que transformar para generar nuevos tipos de comunicaciones. Y este ejemplo es muy recurrente en nuestras organizaciones hoy en día, pero lo que demanda es una atención muy fuerte para estos cambios profundos que se dan en las personas que van cambiando el liderazgo, que van cambiando las relaciones de poder internas, que van cuestionando las relaciones de poder y los privilegios y que son un desafío impresionante para la transformación interna, para el compromiso con un ejercicio de género y para que realmente se puedan tener mecanismos adentro y afuera que puedan resolver estos temas. La inversión interna en el ejercicio de género y en estos nuevos pactos es fundamental para que esto pueda operar hacia afuera. Muchas gracias, Sofía. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rosa Emilia. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, our, our fourth uh, finding, please, um, to be shared by our colleague Beatrix Austin, who's the head of department conflict and transformation research at Berghoff Foundation. Thanks, Beatrix. Hello, Sophia, Johanna, everybody else. Um, really glad that we could be part of this this journey. I'm here to present some uh, thinking around the finding that there are always multiple entry points for embedded integration. And I think for us participating in this peer learning journey was actually also one entry point in thinking through gender integration more systematically across all the, all the contexts that there are. 
Such entry points are always internal and external. They include leveraging donor push or demonstrating success through concrete examples, seizing opportunities created either by external events or by internal organizational crises. Um, and I think sort of our experience at Berkow Foundation can speak to almost all of these. Um, sort of some of, of our journey has been connected to an organizational development process that started back in 2017, 18, when we were really reflecting on a process of growth, who we were, who was part of our organization, and when a lot of questions would also come up around how inclusive are we, how well do we walk the talk that we that we sort of portray and that we want to live in our external peace building practices, also internally. Um, and so that was sort of one of the entry points into that, into having that discussion a lot more explicitly um, internally. Um, and there are a number of others. Um, we've been um, having a long-standing project that works with uh, female ex-combatants, um, really trying to honor the role of women, not just as victims of conflict, but as agents of change in conflict. And that project team has been really sort of an entry point and, and sort of a, a place of seeding um, a, a, a very sort of um, advanced, I think, looking at gender dynamics, looking at masculinities and gender roles, how they interact with each other, but also during the times of the, of the pandemic now, making use of some of their own creative long distance training to bring in the whole organization. So they would organize trainings on conflict sensitive gender analysis on peaceful masculinities, not just for their partners in the field, but also for us internally. So that was another really useful internal entry point that we used. Um, so for us, I think it's a mix of, of sort of colleagues and donors who are really voicing a demand um, creating, sharing good practice and that around that demand. And it is sort of really a, a internal working group leadership that is that is committed, that has a sense of the importance of, of diversity um, on along gender dimensions, but also others, um, which has really led to gender and diversity becoming a more strategic priority for Berkhoff and thereby also opening up. Um, a lot of, of other um, opportunities and investments into sort of really integrating gender more systematically. Thanks, Beatrix. That's um, these great uh, clear examples. Uh, finally, um, I'd like to introduce Diana Tremino, who is the head of program support and learning and a senior, uh, the senior advisor on gender at Safer World. Over to you, Diana. Thanks, Sophia, and um, thanks for inviting us to be part of this really enriching process and this event. Um, the insight that I want to speak to you about today is around how we can integrate gender meaningfully in uh, the design, the implementation, um, uh, the monitoring, evaluation, and learning of our programs. And what really came up strongly from our discussions was that, you know, starting from a gendered conflict analysis and integrating that into designing implementation and mel of our work is fundamental, but uh, it's fundamental to measure how we're doing. So a great tool for accountability, but also it's a really important way of creating space for reflection and learning inside the organization. And then kind of three sub points around this. The first one is the importance of start starting with a gender sensitive conflict analysis, uh, because it is then where you're identifying gendered drivers of conflict, of violence and exclusion, as well as gender drivers of peace and inclusion, that you can identify the opportunities for change that inform your program and intervention logic. Um, so for example, if your gender conflict analysis highlights that women in marginalized groups are not feeling safe to participate in peace processes or don't have access to decision-making spaces, you need to be able when you're designing an intervention, whether it is programmatic policy research, to include, to include uh, throughout your pro program logic and theory of change, ways in which to achieve that. That would mean an outcome that aims to make these spaces more inclusive, 
outputs that facilitate safety and meaningful participation and then activities that lead you into that. And we have found through our lear joint learning that organizations that are systematically embedding gendered analysis into their program cycle are not just you know able to measure how they're doing well but are also pushing themselves farther and striving for gender transformative approaches rather than the more traditional gender sensitive approaches is that i think as a sector we're all, we're all more familiar with the second point is that um, the importance of integrating that, that gendered analysis at all of the levels of your intervention logic and theory of change. We know that a lot of the times we're traditionally used to integrating gender, for example, at output or activity level, because we're thinking that we're, let's say, integrating or mainstreaming gender, gender into a broader peace building program or intervention. And what we have found is that actually that isn't as impactful as we would like it to be. It is really key to make sure that gender is, inform, is, is included and informed at that goal or impact level outcome. And, and as I said, um, throughout your theory of change. And the last one, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, is um, the importance of considering how we do MEL and not just um, the fact that we should be integrating gender into MEL. So really important to think about the tools that we are using, um, the, the methodologies we use, for example, at Safer World, we use outcome harvesting, which is a participatory people-centered reflective process that helps us think about what changes we want to see, whether we are achieving them, and if we're seeing those changes, whether they're really attributable, uh, attributable to our work. And so really understanding um, different uh, ways in which we can do MEL and empower the communities we're working with and our partners uh, to really reflect, use MEL spaces to reflect, not just whether they're, let's say, um, achieving uh, gender parity in activities, for example, but actually, are we achieving change at an outcome and impact level from a gender perspective? And are, are, are our programs really helping to advance gender equality, um, which is ultimately the goal that we're all aiming for? Thank you very much. Thanks, Diana. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Johanna to facilitate the question and answer session. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sophia, and for the excellent panel of speakers. We have quite a few questions already in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, let us start actually what Diana ended up with on programming, because there's a lot of interest on Afghanistan. Um, and there is both uh, Nina Stubb as well as Abbas from EIP asking about, in terms of programming, Nina asking, how can the international community at advance the situation of Afghan women to ensure their participation in peace building under very challenging Taliban rule. Um, and Abbas's question is kind of related, how can one address the challenge of integrating gender into the peacemaking, peace building efforts in Afghanistan? So maybe, Diana, if you can kind of um, elaborate a bit on the programming aspect and gender integration when it comes to Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, sure. Thank you very much, Johanna, and I'm happy to share a little bit of what we've been also um, working on on that front. I mean, I think at the moment, the situation in Afghanistan is, is evolving really fast. And it, when it comes to gender and peace building, or for example, women, peace and security in Afghanistan, a lot of the leaders and activists that lead the, that have led this process for years, um, you know, are still kind of in emergency response mode. A lot of them have left the country. A lot of them are in transit, or some of them have reached their destination. Some of them are in hiding still in Afghanistan or in neighboring countries. And others are trying to respond to the needs of women and girls or, or of themselves and their organizations and the community as they are being investigated by the Taliban, for example, et cetera. And so I think it's a really hard um, question to respond at this moment in the sense of like, what can we be doing right now? My, my main um, response would be, we, we would need to be supporting those leaders wherever they are. Um, to do some sort of mapping of their needs as a movement, as individuals and as a movement, um, and to see how we as an international peace building community can sustain their work from abroad um, as, a, as a collective movement, um, and obviously with impacts uh, and sustaining the, the services and the work that they've done inside Afghanistan. You know, and a lot of them are very active. There's like 
incredible amounts of activity on the internet events where they're really speaking about the situation right now and i think what we need to be thinking of is how do we give them resources wherever they are to to map where they are to map those needs and to then think really creatively you know how do we sustain that massive progress that they achieved uh, for decades um, with them scattered around the world and uh, ensure that you know this change in government isn't really the end of, of the very strong culture and movement of women, peace and security in Afghanistan. Excellent. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, then there's also a kind of continuation question related to entry points. So uh, perhaps I'll address this to Beth Ricks from Burkhoff Foundation. Uh, Margaret Jones from EPLO is asking to give an example of a time when a donor institution's requirements were successfully leveraged to push for gender integration in peace building organizations. So what kind of circumstances, what enabled this, that that donor push could be effectively used? Over to you, Beatrix. Yeah, I'll, I'll again speak from, from sort of our personal ex or our, our collective personal experience. Um, and I can give two fairly recent examples. I mean, one is that sort of some of the, of the more active uh, peace building donors, especially from the Nordic countries, have quite clear um, requirements on an organization actually having explicit gender policies and really addressing this in a, in a sort of uh, way as organizations. And we found that to be sort of a donor push that's really sort of uh, gotten us from more implicit um, implicit practice, which is maybe also not entirely consistent across the board, to really having to come up with uh, with frameworks and to sort of try and in in small ways and in adaptable ways codify what we what we mean mm -hmm. by by being a gender uh, aware organization. So that's one one example, um, and the other one is that we've actually experienced um, the the sort of interest in having reflective conversations on behalf of many foreign ministries of many sort of gender or women peace and security desks in different sort of donor agencies as uh, as sort of really fruitful often demanding also in terms of time sí, muy, eh, muy productivo es exigente porque hay que invertir muchísimo tiempo y hay que prepararse pero el intercambio con muchas personas en distintas instituciones y organizaciones. What do we want to do jointly between donors and implementing organizations? What do we think is important? Where does WPS still fall short? How can we actually make sure that that doesn't happen in the intersection to other sort of emerging um, sort of fields of action like climate change? And so that is a is a is a softer, if you want, but but also sort of a an area where sort of donor interest and donor engagement really has led to, to, to bringing out into, into kind of the conscious, um, the, the thinking about how to implement gender uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. Thank you so much, Beatrix. Uh, and perhaps the next question could go to Ndeye, because she already started a bit on this and relating to kind of technical versus political um, dimensions of gender integration. Uh, a recent graduate in critical security studies, Ryan, uh, is emphasizing how intersectional analysis may have more explanatory power uh, to any effort than to really just single out gender as an independent marker. So the question is whether we should work on integrating gender sensitive approaches to peace building without simultaneously accounting for other axes of oppression such as race. Um, if Ndeya, you would like to reflect on, a bit on this further. Yes, and, and I just want to say that uh, we all know that uh, for a peace building organization, it is important to adapt to adopt an intersectional approach because that is the only way that you can promote uh, gender equality. Because then if you address an intersection, if you adopt an intersectional approach, it also means that you are questioning power and uh, privilege. And, uh, uh, um, you know, and, 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 and also you actually take into account the fact that uh, uh, gender is not about, you know, uh, gender is also, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, understanding that it interacts with other social identity uh, mark, mark, markers, such as age, uh, uh, class, uh, you know, uh, ethnicity, 
uh, caste, uh, sexual uh, uh, orientations. Uh, you know, so actually, in order to really promote gender equality, uh, you know, into peace building activities, you have definitely to, to adopt an intersectional uh, and uh, intersectional approach in order to be more inclusive in the work that you, you do. You're on mute. Yes, thank you so much, Nde. Um So yes, I think that there would be many more questions. Let's take the last one and I would, then this is coming from Ilse Wermink, um, Pax, and saying like, when we say integrate gender, the question is whose peace building process do you mean? How do we shift power dynamics within this? Um, saying the tools, MEL concepts and language are very much still kind of managed and coordinated by organizations based in higher income countries. So how do we shift this balance? And um, I would here maybe invite Rosa Emilia and Sabrina um, just to reflect a few words on this uh, very good question. Sabrina, uh, Rosa Emilia, go ahead. Yes, it's a very good question and it's a very difficult question. I think that I, I, um, I always have a lot of, of, of resistance to, uh, to talk about integrating because uh, it it looks more that we need to transform. Sometimes when you talk about integration, it's something that you bring and you want to integrate. And I think this is more about changing, changing yourself, changing the way you understand the um, the 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 way you understand the world. And I think. I, I will take some of the words that Jonathan was saying in the, in, the, in the first intervention. We need time because for this change and really having and really supporting gender changes, you need to, to understand very deeply what does it mean for yourself and for others. I mean is transforming, transforming yourself. I mean, it's, it's a whole transformation. So I think that we, we need a lot of technical support for doing this, but that technical support is wider than just technical instruments. We need technical support psychologically, a lot of things that will really make you understand what does it mean from a gender perspective to finish with all kinds of discriminations? And if you allow me, I will just take the chance to talk about this, uh, the, the point of view from, from intersectionality. I think, and especially for us, intersectionality is so important, so important, but Although we need to do a gender intersectional approach, we also need to move forward to see how gender intersectionality will give a step forward to talk about the new ways of behaving and the new ways of peace building that will allow us to see discrimination as, as, as something that we need to address, but then we have to, to imagine a world that will be a, with a new kind of, of, of contract, of conveying that will join intersectionally again in a very integral way that will give us the strength to really address and change this, this in a very political way. And that means time, time and, and create, we have to create new instruments. We need to address new instruments. Thank you so much, Rosa Emilia. We are just coming to the end of our uh, question and answers. I'll, I'll give unfairly Sabrina two minutes. Uh, I mean, there was one more question about intersectionality and related to intergenerational dynamics. 
both within women like peace building organizations as well as women's rights movements uh, seeing as age discrimination against either younger or older women uh, being quite prevalent so how to address that as uh, sabrina in two minutes <laughs> thank you very very easy question to answer in just two minutes um i think so one of the things that we as the 13 participating organizations did discuss was the it's a key, very key need for us to be really intersectional in the way that we approach gender integration in our peace building work and that means being very aware of not just differences based on um biological differences such as uh, biological differences of sex, but also around age, around socioeconomic factors, around geographic differences as well, depending on a the context, there's a, a lot of differences in privilege and um, access to resources and power that result from where, where you're born, where you're domiciled, and also, of course, ethnic and racial differences that exist in different conflict contexts. And this is not just, we're not just talking about the global south here, we're also talking about the north. Um, as we've seen over the past few years with se several of the movements that have, that have uh, come to the forefront. So how do we account for these um, challenges when it comes to intergenerational conflicts among uh, among peace building organizations, regardless of where they're from, I think the idea that the way we approach, is it, approach it is that if you have a good gender analysis and if you have a good conflict and political analysis, and it's necessary to have a good socioeconomic understanding also of the context that you're working in, then you, you do identify how these factors are coming into play in the interactions between um play actors in different contexts and then once you're aware of them you take steps to counter them and i understand my two minutes are up so i'm going to stop right. <laughs> no, that's excellent it all starts with the analysis um so thank you so much sabrina and all the colleagues uh for of course we could only scratch the surface with this conversation but that shall continue um i mean the findings of the report also highlighted the important role of leadership so it seems fitting to conclude this conversation with some reflection shared by our institutional leaders uh, as we started with. So we have now the pleasure to welcome three um, leaders of participating partners to share a few words on the current process of gender integration within their own institutions, but also the value and potential of peer learning. And first, we have uh, Michael Keating, the executive director of the European Institute of Peace, uh, EIP. Michael, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Johanna. Let me just quickly congratulate uh, Conciliation Resources CMI for this, and we're very happy to be associated with it. Uh, and this work is incredibly important for an organization like ours, which is uh, focused on the conflict resolution, dialogue and mediation end of things. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one thing we should not forget, and that I guess is informing all our work, is that there are new forms of conflict emerging, new forms of violence, and we do need to understand the gendered impacts of these. Uh, and as one of the previous speakers said, uh, use uh, our gender uh, analysis to illuminate uh, power relations that are affecting people caught up in conflict, at risk of conflict, and ways of dealing with them. In terms of uh, what we are doing, uh, we, are, uh, we recognize that integrating gender in all our work requires long-term uh, dedicated leadership, as well as money, uh, political will, uh, firmness, and self-reliance. And clearly, we need to go beyond the box ticking and actually try and strengthen uh, the culture of our own organizations if we're going to do this uh, from a firm basis. In terms of where we are at, uh, maybe we're behind some of uh, the other organizations, but uh, two years ago, we did develop a gender and peacemaking strategy uh, to cover the next uh, few years. This is something that we presented uh, to our staff and to our board, and indeed, of course, it emerged from conversations with our staff and colleagues on the ground, uh, and it represents a whole-of-institute approach. 
Um, mm -hmm. We do face a number of deficits. Uh, I have to admit that our board consists of eight people. And until a month ago, other than the chair, who is a female, all eight of them were males. Um, uh, we now have one female board member. So it was a tremendous irony presenting to them on this, uh, a, a group of men. But I think that, that, that uh, they are now more sensitive to this. But we now have five female um, we now have five MEPs observers to our board and they're all female. In terms of the challenges we face, um, institutionally, it's not so much lack of will, it's lack of capacity, time and resources. Um, uh, the impact of what we're doing is di both difficult to measure and not terribly impressive to those who are looking at, for example, what's happened in Afghanistan, what's happened in Yemen and elsewhere. Um, uh, and, and there are many dilemmas that we're facing. So finally, what are we committed to improve? We are doing what I think has uh, clearly come through this report and the conversation is integrating gender into everything uh, we do. Our structure, our culture, our monitoring and evaluation, our processes, where we're having conversations uh, internally with our colleagues and with our staff, uh, and we want to increase our engagement with female policymakers, but we are very, very committed to moving forward in this area and holding everyone to account uh, using scorecards to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much and also for EIP's crucial role in this dialogue and process. Um, well, second, then I would like to introduce Diana Lepe, who is the Acting Executive Director of Servicios y Asesoria para la Paz, Serapas. So joining us from very early morning in Mexico, over to you, <laughs> Diana. Hola, hola a todas, a todas. Eh, pues primero eh, voy a estar hablando en español y agradecer la oportunidad de participar en el, en el, en el espacio, ¿no? Como, como parte de, de Serapas y que y tener la oportunidad de, de pronunciarme eh, sobre, eh, pues sobre lo que este espacio implica, ¿no? Eh, Serapa siendo una organización que ha estado trabajando el, el tema de construcción de paz a partir de la transformación positiva de conflictos en México ya hace 25 años, pues hemos ido procurando adaptarnos a las necesidades de los, de los procesos y comunidades que hemos acompañado, marcadas por una compleja realidad ¿no? en, eh, en México, en Latinoamérica, eh, pero también procurando comprender y comprometernos con, con causas que profundamente fortalecen las estrategias y, y acciones que como constructores de paz pues vamos buscando generando eh, un mundo, de, haciendo del mundo un lugar mejor. ¿no? Y eh, pues bueno, poco a poco en la organización pues hemos ido comprendiendo que la transformación de las causas injustas no es posible sin, sin la lucha de las mujeres, ¿no? sin reconocer la voz de, de, de todas nosotras y que también no es posible sin cuestionar nuestras propias prácticas, nuestras formas de relacionarnos como equipo, con, con los actores que acompañamos. Y esto pasa forzosamente por, por, por cuestionar, eh, pues, pues nuestro, como diría Rosa Emilia, nuestro patriarcado que, que llevamos dentro todas y todas. ¿no? Y en este sentido, pues de manera paulatina y, y humilde también, hemos ido incorporando a, a nuestro ser institucional eh, reflexiones que nos animen a mejorar nuestra práctica en la labor de la paz, reconociendo como punto ciego de entrada la mirada de género, ¿no? Y actualmente en la vida será paz, luego de, de un impas, eh, pues nos encontramos cada vez más comprometidas con eh, fortalecer los espacios de reflexión nos, interna que nos lleven a generar mecanismos de respuesta ante conflictos por razón de género y una guía de nuestro actor y compromiso con los actores que acompañamos, retomando las experiencias de, de las organizaciones hermanas mexicanas de América Latina y, y de diferentes partes del, del mundo, como en este caso. ¿no? Eh, y, y de aquí hemos estado aprendiendo en temas tanto de educación como de seguridad y protección, de defensa de la tierra y el territorio, de temas de desaparición eh, forzada y por particulares y diferentes luchas. Eh, y pues ya, y con esto, ¿no? Decir que, que, que son estos espacios de encuentro eh, entre pares y los resultados que de ellos salen los que nos permiten dar sentido a nuestras prácticas y reflexiones 
que aunque a veces como organizaciones van siendo intuitivas, van caminando a, hacia posibilidades que muchas otras han, han caminado, enriqueciéndonos con su experiencia. Y espero que, que, que el testimonio escrito que hemos dejado a partir de este espacio, ¿no? pues anime a, a florecer en, en más tierras a organizaciones comprometidas con la paz, con la lucha feminista, sin lo cual el cambio de paradigma hacia uno más transformador no será posible. ¿no? Y en ese marco, pues también como será paz, estamos comprometidas a, a ir trabajando en este, en este esfuerzo, aunque a veces resulte lento o, o difícil. ¿no? Gracias. Thank you so much, Diana, uh, for your also your personal contribution and role throughout this dialogue. And finally, um, I would like to invite Itsu Adachi, the executive director of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Um, we know it's very late already in Japan, so it's a great show of commitment. So um, Adachi-san, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, uh, a really, little bit late, but not so deeply late. So, so uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, get uh, to have uh, given the opportunity to join this uh, uh, very much a valuable event today. Uh, I'd like to express special thanks to uh, Constellation Research uh, and uh, the CMI. Uh, and, uh, Please for your endeavor so far. The Sasaka Peace Foundation is a private foundation from Japan for international cooperation and exchange. Now we are not specifically uh, focused only on peace building for our activities. And you know that uh, we have a uh, uh, lot of very variety of uh, the programs such as uh, the exchange program between uh, the that several specific country or regions like uh, the Japan, US and Japan, China and Japan, Middle East. Uh, and also the, we have a uh, lot of uh, research programs on the very much traditional security and uh, also the, uh, the ocean and so on. And gender also uh, the gender innovation and investment. So uh, the management of uh, the Sasaka Peace Foundation has decided to work on gender mainstreaming since last year, uh, specifically, and then in the context of uh, the diversity and the inclusion in the organization. And I studied modest in initiatives for creating opportunities for casual discussions among staffs on gender or enhanced training for gender lens programming. But although there are staffs working directly for gender equality in their works, and interested in integrating gender lens, such as our staffs working, specifically the for, for peace building, the, the uh, almost all staffs are aware of the importance of the gender mainstreaming in the process of the peace building and peace mediation process. And then so uh, gender group, gender innovation group we have, that they, they are very much uh, politically and then very much aggressively working for economic empowerment of the women the, and also the gender lens investment. But on the other hand, there are other staffs who don't have enough knowledge to, the, uh, to add their work, to the, add uh, the gender lens and the gender uh, the equality and the gender diversity uh, in their original work. Because that is sometimes they cannot be uh, the aware of the, the merit of uh, the gender integration uh, into their own uh, business. But we think we need to start the, with their, in, their interested and then the motivated staffs first and show clearly the, uh, the merit and then the impacts, how big impact that we can get the, 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 from this uh, the, uh, framework. And then also the importance of the gender integration and expand such initiatives step by step um, at organization wide. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, so, I mean, I can speak on behalf of all of the partners. I would like to thank you, uh, all of you in the audience, uh, both speakers, colleagues, friends, uh, for this very rich discussion. I think the fact that we convened today speaks 
to the commitment and ambition that we all share to genuinely integrate gender in the very DNA of conflict resolution and peace building. Uh, it's also a very fitting way to kick off o October, which is the, the month of uh, marking the 21st anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, and really timely reminder that we do still have a lot of work to do to translate that agenda into reality. So this discussion, the reflection, the learning will certainly continue. There is an old proverb saying that if you want to go quickly, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. And together we are continuing the journey. Um, thanks for everyone. Uh, very, I hope you will all have a great day, be it in the morning, uh, afternoon, or good night, and look forward to a continued discussion. Thank you very much.